Uh, so I will start with just some slides. Um, I will introduce myself. I will introduce my colleague, um, Alex Stella will introduce herself. So there's two of us here today. Um, and then we will talk a little bit about Zenbio itself, how we work, and a little bit about uh, examples of how we've worked in the past, just to give you an idea of how we can work with you as a researcher. And then at the end, um, I will just uh, ask for some questions. So if you have any questions at any point, let us know. So Estella, do you want to start with introducing yourself and then yeah. I will talk about myself? Perfect. No problem. So thanks for joining us today. So my name is Estela Perez Santa Marina. And you may guess by my name in Spanish. So I, I did my undergrad in biotechnology and my master's as well in Valencia. And I work after a while across Europe in different institutions, including Spain, Italy, and Austria. And after I moved to the UK uh, five years ago to do my PhD in neuroscience. So in my background is in neuroscience. And since December, I'm a new member in Shinbayo. So I manage all the South European accounts, including this one. So if you have any questions after that, we, we can discuss it. And now, Julia, you can continue. Sure. Um, this is me. I don't put a very interesting European map because uh, my background is not so interesting. I did do a placement at the uh, Autonomous University in Barcelona in Spain, but most of my education has been in the UK. I moved here when I was um, 18 for university and I stayed for the PhD. and. As you can see from my very fancy logos, I did uh, my PhD between academia and industry. So at GSK, I spent the majority of my PhD. That's given me some insight into um, the, the needs of scientists on the other side, you know, not the academics, but the commercial scientists. And I'll be talking about that a little bit during my talk because I think it's, it's an important part um, to think about because science is not only carried out in academic labs, it's carried out in several types of labs. Um, so, as I talk about herself, I have talked about myself. Before we talk about Zimbayo, I kind of want to talk about you researchers listening now. Um, I think that what many people think when they attend these meetings is that they are maybe not inventors. We're talking about new inventions, but I think it's a misconception. So when I say the research tool you created, this can be something that you got from a colleague and modified or something you bought commercially and modified. So when we talk about novel intellectual property, that's what we're talking about, the, the part that you added that added value to the reagent. So this, this, the parental material belongs to someone else, but the addition belongs to you. So if you're thinking during my talk, oh, this doesn't apply to me, I have never generated something from, from nothing, it doesn't really matter. So this is what science is. We build on other people's publications, we build on other people's science, and the value that you create is worth quite a lot. And when I say value, a lot of people think, you know, commercialization, this is all about money. It's really not. The value is in accelerating research. You know, if you want to use a cell line, you shouldn't have to replicate something you saw in a paper. You should be able to access it and save yourself the six months of establishing a stable cell line or if there's a monoclonal polyclonal antibody you've described somewhere, you should be able to have access to it. So this is a quick rundown. I'm not going to read it out entirely, but you will get these slides later of the kinds of things that we most often deal with and why it's considered novel. Um, and on the left here with the icons, you can see in Zimbio, we talk about research reagents or research tools. And these are the things we mean. So mouse models and um, cell lines, small molecules and antibodies are the vast majority of our portfolio, but our interest is in accelerating life science research and that happens with all kinds of tools. So we also take organelles, we take peptides, um, bacterial strains, anything that you spend time making, you have invested in it, it should pay back into the scientific community. Uh, now that I've discussed all of that, all of us here, um, I will introduce some bio. So, um, it is the world's largest nonprofit dedicated to life science research tools of all kinds. Um, so I've described the all kinds. It's the, it is the largest. So there's a few people that do what we do, um, but we are the biggest. Currently, we have something like 7,000 tools in the portfolio. Um, we have partnerships with uh, 160. Actually, this is a bit old. We had a meeting last week. We had 172 research institutes worldwide currently. So we have at least one on every continent. Um, 
if you follow our Twitter, you can just scroll through every time we make a new partnership, we tweet about it, and you can see the partnerships that we create. So we don't focus only on the UK. The charity that owns Zimbio is a very UK-centric uh, charity, but we are not. And the absolute most important thing that I would like you to take away from this talk is our mission at the bottom here. And it's to make life science research tools easily available and accelerate life science research. So as I described before, if you read something in a paper, you should be able to access it and use it for your science. And not to have access to it means replicating those tools and that's a waste of time and money and effort from you. So uh, I've mentioned a few times the charity that owns us. Um, just so you know, we Zimbio is a charitable organization. We don't have shareholders. We don't have a board of directors. Any profit that we make goes to the charity. Um, and this is a very old charity. So in some way it has existed for over hundred years. And for the last 25 years, there has been someone like me sitting in an office trying to take the things that are in the lab and take them beyond the lab into the world, make sure that they're accessible to scientists in academic labs and commercial labs, in in vitro diagnostic uh, companies, uh, making sure that science is translated because that's the ultimate goal of science is to make an impact in the world. Uh, there's two offices at Zimbabwe right now in London in the United Kingdom and in Boston in the United States. The Boston office handles just the United States and Canada, and then the London office handles every other country. I think it's it's nice to have people from um, other countries as well, because I'm, I'm currently working on a partnership with a university in, um, in India as well. So we are global and we are not just about cancer, we are Zimbabwe. We are every cancer tool, uh, every type of research tool in every country in the world. So just the charity itself, in case you're interested, um, I think the bottom part is the most relevant, but just to give you some background about the scale that we're talking about. So we are a charity that funds research in cancer specifically. So each year we spend 540 million pounds on research projects. Uh, we also do our own clinical trials in-house and we partner, and this is a huge part of what we do, we partner with big pharmaceutical companies to run clinical trials, to develop um, therapeutics for cancer um, diagnosis and for treatment. We have um, a lot of researchers that we fund internally. So we have institutes that are part of Cancer Research UK and scientists that are fully funded by us. Uh, and they, you know, they, they publish, they do everything that you do. So before Zimbio was global, Zimbio was just for Cancer Research UK funded scientists, and we just helped them develop what they um, were making in the labs into the more com commercial sphere. Then the bottom part, like I said, is hopefully quite interesting to you um, as international or non-UK researchers. Um, we've recently partnered with the National Cancer Institute, uh, Cancer Institute in the United States, and we wanted to create a global funding platform. And we've named this Cancer Grand Challenges, and this is to really tackle the big problems in cancer to try and move forward more quickly with finding a cure. So as I said, we've been doing this for a very long time, and we have our internal scientists as well that you know we speak to on a very regular basis, and we found it's kind of always the same problem when we talk about commercialization to scientists. And the problem is that they have a lot going on. I'm sure you will agree, you know, you are you know, leading the scientists in your lab, you're training them as well. Uh, you are you know, trying to prove your impact beyond publication. So you're not only are you publishing, you're also trying to prove impact beyond that. You go to conferences and speaking and really trying to show how far your science can go. Then you also, of course, when you make a research tool, you have to respond to requests from collaborators, anyone that's interested, even industry. And that brings with it its own problems. So if you find the research tools, you know, in your lab, or if you need to use a new research tool, find it somewhere else, you have to produce them in a house. So it's not just a matter of you have a lot of vials of the same cell line ready to send out. In reality, you have to assign somebody in the lab to generate new vials so you can send them out. Then you have to um, handle all of the paperwork. So I'm sure you will have help from you know, your technology transfer office, but there are you know, um, legal issues to consider. So there is paperwork involved in transferring these materials. And finally, if you think about shipping, it can be complicated, especially with mouse models. Um, and the logistics that is um, implicated in that. If you're shipping to a different country, there's different paperwork you will need. 
And our opinion, so just to summarize this whole thing, why this is such a problem, even though I'm sure you're just sweating thinking about all of this work, it's not what you are the expert at. You are the expert at science. You're the expert at research, especially in your field. And you shouldn't also have to be an expert at all of these other things we're talking about. It's taking time away from you working on the things that you are very, very good at. So Zimbio hopefully can help. And we do this in a few different ways. So we try to save you time. All of that top branch I was talking about in the first slide, we just wanna take that away. You shouldn't have to do something that takes time away from you doing science. So we can do all of the shipping and logistics, um, all of the paperwork that's about the intellectual property rights, make sure that they are protected and make sure that they are everything that is shared with the world is shared in the correct way. Um, we also can, you know, um, find new collaborators. So, you know, you go to conferences and you do the networking and you try to find new collaborations. But with the Zimbio website, your tool will be on the website with your name and your institute. If somebody is seeing that you're working on something interesting in their field, it's the easiest thing in the world to get in touch with you. We also link all of the publications that are related to this tool so they can see, you know, what have you done in the past? What are you doing now? How did you get to this tool? And, you know, there can be some, some potential for collaboration there. Now, this is the part that I'm very passionate about, um, making your research tools available to other bench scientists, um, because academia is the source of all of these research tools. When I was working in GSK, it wasn't a matter of creating a stable cell line. We have all of the equipment to do this. We have all of the expertise, but it's just not how it works. If you suggest doing that, like I did, they will look at you strangely. They say you just find the paper that you're, you know, you're trying to do similar work and then email the scientists and try to get a license to the cell line. And to be honest, it's just, it's not an efficient system and it, it limits how quickly science can move. And it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that. So through Zimbio, the same way that that website page can find new collaborators in academia, the same website page can help scientists, you know, at the bench doing the same work you do just in a commercial sphere to find your tools. Um, then, you know, between academia and the more commercial scientists, there is a community in your field. And you will know many of these scientists already because you will go to conferences and meet them, maybe have collaborations already. But this is hopefully going to result in a, in a way that all of the people doing similar work in a similar field, um, they can see each other, you know, every time they publish something new, they generate a new tool. They can see each other on the Zimbio website and you're keeping up to date with what other people are doing, the direction that your field is going in, um, and also what is, you know, what kinds of tools uh, is the commercial sphere interested in? Because if you, if you do want to make this a more commercial endeavor, it's, it's more easily done if you have a platform, you know, to display your tools on. Then we can protect your legacy. So this is, um, I'm mainly speaking to scientists that are looking to retire soon, or maybe you, you have retired, but you're still, you know, emeritus and you're still around at the university. You know, you've spent your whole career making so many research tools. And this, this has taken an investment of your time, of your energy, of, of the funding that you get. And they're now sitting in freezers. And there has to be the question of what will happen when you leave. And at Zimbio, we just, yeah, as much as you can't stand the thought of all of that going into the bin, we also can't stand that thought. If there has been an investment in time and in energy, if it has been useful to you, it will be useful to others. And we would like to help you, you know, protect these things. We have a biorepository at Zimbio. We can store the things, we can produce them as well. None of that should be on you. And none of that should be something that you worry about losing if, if you retire. And finally, I, you know, believe strongly that we have a shared mission. Um, maybe we're a bit more cancer focused uh, at Cancer Research UK, but not in Zimbio, Zimbio is everything. Um, but the mission is just to accelerate science and to make sure that the science that we do has an impact beyond the lab and even within the lab and within different labs um, of collaborators. So that was quite a lot of information. This is my favorite slide. This is all of that information, just very simple. How is it? actually going to work. So this is on the left, you can see the Institute has the research tools. They are, as we speak, sitting in your freezers, you know, hopefully being used, but maybe they're from five years ago, you're not using them anymore. 
but you have them at your institute. Then they are licensed to Zimbio. So um, we do have already a partnership, um, at least with one of the campuses, and it can be extended. Um, so it should be a very easy process. It's just a matter of declaring it. You know, you know what you have, you make a list and you present it to your technology transfer office. We share with academic scientists via MTA. So these are called material transfer agreements or even direct sales. If it's a small molecule, we just sell it because it's a single use item. And just to make it super clear, it's minimal cost to scientists. Um, we can't make it completely free because we would stop existing as a business, uh, but we charge as little as we can. So it's most of the time, I think all of the time, it's significantly cheaper than commercial competitors. So an antibody from Zimbio will be much cheaper than one from Abcam, for example. So we just price it at production cost, or if that's a lot of money, we just make it cheaper and we eat that cost. And the reason that we can do that is because we have the other branch. So apart from sharing with academic scientists, we share with life science industry. So this can be anything from pharmaceutical companies, like you know me when I was at GSK, if someone had shared the cell line with me, I would have been very, very happy. Um, also um, in vitro diagnostic companies, you know they are desperate for new antibodies, especially recombinants, you know, monoclonals are great, but recombinants are the future. Uh, who else? Just uh, even Abcam, you know, if, if we're trying to make these things easily available, then licensing them to Abcam is the best way to do that, make it even more visible to scientists everywhere. And uh, this licensing, this is where we make profit. We don't want to make profit from academics. We want to share with academics. We do charge a little bit of money so we don't go under, but life science industry is where we make most of our money. And this is uh, the, the most, you know, it's, it's an important part. It's not what's most important to us because, you know, academic scientists is what is our main focus, but this is where we make the money that is able to sustain the business. Um, so finally, uh, we want to talk about the niche. I've mentioned this several times, but I wanted to be very clear. We don't just work in cancer. You can see from these bars, cancer is a big part of the portfolio, um, just because for such a long time, we were only working with cancer scientists. It's only since 2014 that we opened up to any scientist anywhere in the world. So in that time, we've got a lot of tools from a lot of different universities all over the world and from a lot of different fields of science. Um, and you know, on the left again, the kinds of tools that we take, um, but, you know, we will discuss any any proposal you have. Maybe it's not great for us in bio portfolio, but we want to discuss it anyway. It's a good opportunity. And now, after all of that talking, I think um, this is all of the technical information covered. What is in bio? How does it work? And now we're going to move on to some examples. Estella will be taking over, talk about the examples. And we're only doing two examples because we could go on forever, but we want to really accentuate the fact that it's different types of things that we deal with. And the way we work, the way we help you commercialize is very flexible. Every product is going to be a little bit different. And so the way that we make it available is going to be a little bit different. So, oh, apologies, there's a summary slide. I, I'm not going to talk through it. This is a summary of everything I've talked about. It'll be available to you in, in this format. I'll send you a PDF, but this is just a summary of the three previous slides. But Estella, would you like to talk about um, Plasmax and case studies? Sure. So um, thank you for the introduction and not the talk. So now I'm going to explain just two cases, as Julia mentioned. The first one is called Plasmax. Plasmax is a cell culture media that it was developed by Saverio Tardito in the Cancer Research UK Bitson Institute. So Saverio was working in 2012 in how glutamine metabolism affect the biology of brain tumors. And he re realized he required a careful regulation of the amino acids between the cell culture media just to, to study this process. However, when, when he tried to use the, commer the commercial available products, he realized that they were not suitable. They were not good enough for, to study this process because they were not close to the in vivo environment of the tumors. So this is why he optimized the concentrations of over 80 compounds, typically found in human plasma, to achieve the cell growth cell grow media in which the in vivo environment is mimic, is more close to what is physiological. And, and 
he developed then Plasmax. So he published all this information, he is publicly available, the recipe is in a paper, one of his papers, and anybody in the world can actually replicate it. However, he was still receiving a lot of uh, requests to share the cultural media because they couldn't recreate it in the lab. It's very difficult to make a product with so many components in a standardized way in a research lab. So this is why Saverio worked with Shimbayo. Can you go to the next one, Julia? Okay, so uh, he partnered with us because we can do all this scale up. We can produce the Plasmax and cell media culture in a high volume. So we can supply to all our customers worldwide. So we also do the promotion of the of the re, of the reagent. So you can see here in the in the left side, you can see different examples of how we promote the cell culture media with a different type of blogs, interviews with the scientists, and also studies comparing the cell media Plasmax with the commercial available ones like DMEM that is typically used by all scientists. And currently we have all, we take charge of all the shipping logistics and also all the you know, uh, legal aspects of you know, supplying Plasmax to different scientists worldwide. And currently we have over a dozen of research groups that working with Plasmax using in their daily experiments. And very soon there is going to be published data from other scientists besides Saverio using these cell culture media in their own experiments. So this was an example of a very successful case of some product that was developed by a scientist because he couldn't find something he needed for his research. So how he, this product went from his bench to the bench of many scientists worldwide, just because his team bio could help. Um, can you go to the next one? Yeah. Another example we have is the polyclonal rainbow antibodies. So maybe most of you know what is rainbow technology right now, but it was developed by um, Doen Kai in University of Michigan. And this is a genetic cell labeling technique where hundreds of different hues can be generated by stochastic measurements. So this can allow to detect individual uh, neuronal types at the same time in different animal models like mice, drosophila, and zebrafish, as well as the non-neuronal cells in like Leah in mice. Um, the antibodies they develop, the, these rainbow antibodies, polyclonal antibodies, they help to label this type of cells, amplifying the signal and also avoiding the quenching when you visualize these uh, complex structures in the microscope and allows the multicolor, uh, multicolor labeling of neural circuits. So it has been very widely used, the rainbow technology, and they were, the, the researcher was receiving so many requests to sub, supply these antibodies to many researchers in the world. And they were spending so much time just producing them and doing all the legal aspects, the material transfer agreements and the shipping and everything. It was too much time consuming for them, so they couldn't really do it. They wanted to share the tool, but it was very difficult for them to invest so much time and money in doing all this process. So this is when, Shimbayo stem, stepped in and helped uh, the researchers. So, can you go to the next one, Julia, please? Okay, so we provided the administration team to allow for the effective management of the polyclonal antibodies. So we take charge of all the storage of them, the shipping, the replying to the inquiries of the researchers, as well as the, all the legal aspects that are, can be very time consuming and researchers really need a lot of experience just to deal with this type of uh, agreements. And also we have a dedicated data sheet where every scientist that wants to use this technology just to, has to go and select which type of antibodies they want against which type of fluorescent protein, because there are many, or what type of host animals they want to use them, because we have like rat, mouse, chicken, and guinea pig. They can make their own specific kit, and we just can have to ship them and deal with all the legal aspects instead of the researchers doing it. And also we gave to, to the group, to the research group, this global platform to, to show their technology and to make it available worldwide to anybody that wants to use it and wants to you know, do investigation with, with it. And these are the two examples that we present today. So if you have any questions, please let us know and we can go more in deep. Yes. And also, if you are interested in these kinds of stories, if you think that maybe there's something that's more relevant to you, on our website, we have a whole section of case studies, just different people we worked with in different ways. And it really is almost always just a little bit different to the next one. And we are very flexible um, because we know that the, the needs of the scientists are quite flexible. 
This is more or less the end, but before I stop, I'm going to try to preempt two questions that are very common. So I've tried to accentuate how little work this is going to be for you, but still a lot of, especially PIs, are quite nervous that this is going to be extra work for them. They don't have time. It doesn't have to be you is the answer to that. Uh, a postdoc in your lab, even a PhD student in your lab, they can be your translational representative for your lab. They are the people that talk to your technology transfer office. They are the people that talk to us. They will need a little bit of input from you because maybe they're new and you have a lot more you know, years without them. But it, it really doesn't have to be you. Um, we do as much of the work as we can for you. Your technology transfer office will help as much as possible. So as long as there's somebody in your lab that knows where's the freezer, where the thing's stored, that should be more than enough. Point number two, just before um, we move on to questions, is we know that we've already had a partnership. Uh, we first partnered um, between the ICGB in Italy and Zimbayo in 2018. And uh, just to be super upfront, there has not been income yet. And I hope that this talk didn't give you the impression that you're going to become a millionaire within a year by joining Zimbayo. This is not the way it is. I have no reason to be dishonest about that. Um, I can introduce you to a very interesting concept. It's called the Pareto Principle. Maybe you've heard about it. Uh, any sort of um, company, any any shop, will um, be you know will have the Pareto Principle apply. And the principle is that out of 100% of the things you have, 80% of them will never attract attention. Maybe here and there, one person will be attracted to it, but they will not make money. They will not really become blockbusters. We like to call them blockbusters. Of the 20% that do make money and that there's general interest, it's really not a huge amount of income. In Zimbayo, we find that around 5% of the whole portfolio, so we have 7,000 something tools right now, around 5% are our blockbusters. They make a lot of money. So our recommendation when we work with institutes is always have at least 100 things with the Zimbayo portfolio. This can, you know, make sure that you have a very good chance of being successful. Uh, and currently we don't have a hundred things. This is part of the reason we have this webinar. I think if scientists knew that this service is available to them, maybe, you know, they would be more interested in trying it out and putting some of their things online to see if anybody's interested. And this is the way that this kind of commercialization can benefit the institute that you work for as well, because it'll, you know, be more commercially viable, also show that, you know, people at the ICGB are making interesting things that are int interesting to the commercial sphere. And this is a place that you can find um, new tools if you are in a commercial uh, environment. The slide I have right now is just two of the scientists that we work with and the benefit that they personally see in working with Zimbayo. So on the left, it's more about, you know, older research that this man did a long time ago, uh, just be, just still being relevant and still being useful to somebody in the world, if, instead of just sitting in a freezer somebody somewhere. And on the right, we have the fact that Zimbayo has scale and Zimbayo has production capabilities. You shouldn't be producing and shipping as, you know, whatever percentage of the work you do. You should be doing research because that's what you're best at. Let Zimbayo do paperwork and shipping and all of that. And that's the end. I hope that was interesting to you. And um, these are the contact details of, you know, if you're interested, if you think you have something cool in the freezer, um, feel free to tell a postdoc or a PhD student to contact these the relevant email addresses and just let us know what do you have, uh, how would you like to see it go into the world, um, and ask any questions as well now or later. You can email Estella. I didn't include my email address here, but um, it's the same format, first name, last name, feel free to email me. Uh, yeah, like I said, we like to talk to scientists. It's the best part of the job. So yeah, any conversation about the science you do would be great.